All right, would you please stand as I read our text for this morning? I'll be reading Acts chapter 1, or chapter 4, sorry, verses 1 through 22. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. The many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well." This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name." So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is God's word. You. you may be seated. Anytime and everywhere that the gospel is preached, uh, especially as, as we're examining this through the book of Acts, there seems to be two responses that follow. Okay, so preaching the gospel and then something happens. The first thing that happens is conversion. People, Peter, John, stand up, preach the gospel. People hear about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, forgiveness in his name, and they are cut to the heart, and they are converted. They become Christians or followers of Christ. Twice so far in the book of Acts, Luke, the author, has taken special note of these conversions. The first comes in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Peter has just gotten up and preached the gospel, and it says, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Then in, Luke, or in Acts chapter 3, Peter again preaches the gospel. Remember, a man was healed. A man who was crippled for some 40 years was healed, and it begs the question, what in the world is going on? And Peter stands up, he doesn't take credit, he doesn't claim to have some special power, but he preaches the gospel. And we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Okay, so Acts chapter 1, there's 120 people. The end of Acts chapter 2, there's about 3,000 men. The end of Acts chapter 3 and the beginning of Acts chapter 4, we're up to 4,000 souls. Is this exciting? Right, this is crazy, right? This is an incredible thing. However, that's not all that happens when the gospel is preached. Many of the things, as we've said in our study, that happen early in Acts just keep repeating themselves throughout the book of Acts. When the gospel is preached, people are converted, and then there's conflict. There's conflict. It repeats itself over 
and over and over again. Sometimes this is people getting beat up and thrown outside of the city. Sometimes this is a full-out riot. Here we have conflict. Conflict almost always in some shape or form follows faithful gospel preaching. So this morning in our text, this is the first time in the book of Acts that we are introduced to any sort of formal conflict. I'm not talking about interpersonal conflict that comes from faith. This is a formal conflict uh, that the early church faces. So we're going to look at three three elements of the conflict. The first is the people of conflict, meaning who is the church in conflict with? The people of conflict. Second of all is the point of conflict. What is the issue of contention? And thirdly, the power of conflict. What happens as a result of conflict, okay? The people, the point, and the power of conflict. We'll start with the people. What we imagine... What we hear happening in the story is obviously going to shape the way we hear and respond to the story. Luke is very, very clear in this text as to who the people of conflict were. He names them by groups and offices, and then he also names specific names. He refers to the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, the rulers, the elders, the scribes, the high priest, Caiaphas, John Alexander, and then he goes on to say, and all who were of the high priestly family. Now, I'm going to wager a bet here. If you know very, very little about about the Bible at all, there's one thing you probably know is that the people that I just mentioned are religious people, right? These are religious leaders, some of them with really fancy hats. And when we read this text through the lens of conflict between religious leaders in the church, it loses its edge. There's something more happening to this text. We have to understand the context of the text. The Jewish people who are living in Jerusalem, this is where this is happening right right now. Acts is going to follow Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Right now we're in Jerusalem. And the Jewish people who lived in Jerusalem were ultimately under Roman rule, right? They were ultimately under Roman rule. However, they were given a good measure of freedom to govern themselves. So ultimately, under Rome, but when it comes to local authorities and magistrates, the people of Jerusalem were primarily governed by Jewish people. This is not just a conflict between religious leaders, okay? You have to understand that the the civic and public affairs of Jerusalem were driven and governed by Jewish leaders. They were governed by these religious leaders. And and most, if not exclusively, all of the the civic, local, cultural uh, city issues that they would have faced would have been dealt with locally by those leaders. We don't have this separation of church and state as as we might think. Now, there's one exception here. Local issues are handled by the Jewish leaders with one exception, okay? Crimes are dealt with by Jewish leaders. Trials are dealt with by the Jewish leaders. The elders, scribes, Sadducees, the temple of God. All of them are dealt with Jewish leaders. There's one exception, and that exception is capital punishment, Now, we know this because of the gospel accounts of Jesus. We can just look back to the execution of Jesus and see how local issues are handled. In John chapter 18, verses 12 through 14, it says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So here's a snapshot. In this snapshot, we have soldiers, captain, and the officers of the Jews together coming to Jesus to do what? To talk theology? No. To what? To arrest him. What does this look like? It it looks a lot like local authorities showing up to arrest a guy 
because that is exactly what it is. Again, there's not this clear distinction between church and state or Rome and the Jewish leaders. There is, a, is a, an agreement, a partnership here. Now, it's important to notice that these Jewish leaders, the ones referred to in this text, they had the power to arrest somebody. They had the power to put somebody on trial and accuse them. They had the power to not only execute that trial, but then to come up with a sentence for that trial and for whatever crime was committed. However, there's one thing the Jewish authorities could not do. Do you know what it was? There's one punishment they could not carry out. It was the punishment of capital, capital punishment. They could not execute Jesus. They could arrest him. They could try him. They could find him guilty. They could bring a charge. They could not execute him. That is why Jesus was not executed by the elders, the scribes, the Sadducees, and those of the high priestly family. He was executed by who? Rome, doing the bidding of the Jewish leaders. Why does this matter so much? It matters because here we have a snapshot of the first uh, first conflict that this early church is facing and understand the conflict is with local magistrates. This is with local governing authorities. This is not just some religious conflict. This, this issue, this conflict looks a lot like a group of people being in trouble with local governing authorities. This would include people in offices like mayors and city councils and boards of commissioners and governors. This is what's happening. And when we see the text through that lens, it begins to take on a unique and I think appropriate weightiness for us. So who is the conflict with? The conflict is with the local authorities. Now, what is the point of conflict? What is the big deal? What is this conflict over? Well, we know what it was over. It's listed twice in verses one through three. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming uh, in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. By the way, who else got arrested and thrown in prison at night when nobody was paying attention? Who? Jesus did by the same people. Verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach it all in the name of Jesus. What was the problem? preaching and teaching the life, death, resurrection of Jesus, and forgiveness in his name. This is the one thing the local authorities did not want the church to do. You want to meet together? Oh, that's, that's fine. You want to pray in private? That's fine. You want to break bread? That's fine. What can't you do? Don't preach. Don't preach Christ. We have to ask ourselves, why was this such a concern for the local authorities? Why didn't they object to breaking bread in homes and meeting together and praying? And why did they object to the gathering of the people and the preaching of the gospel? Why didn't they object to personal private faith that has no implication in the world? And why did they object to the public declaration that Christ is Lord? Why? We tend to think of this as just being a theological issue. And of course, there is a theological dimension to this. We, uh, Luke refers to the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. Here is the claim that Christ is resurrected. There is some theological conflict. However, I would argue that it's not the main thing. It's not primarily a theological issue. Rather, it has to do with politics and power. Now, where do I get that? Well, first of all, these guys got arrested. But verse 12, look at this. This is what Peter says. He's been arrested. Here's what he says. And there is salvation in no one else, 
For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. How many of you have heard this verse before? You've heard this verse, right? I've preached this verse. And often if I'm thinking or talking to somebody who is a pluralist, that is somebody who believes there's one top to the mountain and there's many trails to get there. So Jesus might be your trail and I might have Oprah as my trail and whatever, right? That, that we, you know, we're all just heading to the top of the same mountain. We go, no, 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 no. There's salvation in no other name. There's only one way, right? This refutes pluralism or somebody who ascribes to a false world religion. You think that, that, that uh, Muhammad has a path for you, or you are a Mormon, or you're Jehovah's Witness, or you're whatever other world religion. You say, no, 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 they can't save you. Joseph Smith can't save you. Those leaders can't save you. There is salvation in no other name under heaven except for Christ, right? And, and those are accurate understandings and applications of the text. However, Peter is not talking to pluralists. That's not a problem. Peter's also not talking to Muslims or Jehovah's Witness or, you know, first of all, they don't exist then, but he's not dealing with these numerous false world religions. Who is Peter talking to? He's talking to Jews in power in Jerusalem. Why does he look to them and say there is salvation in no other name? Why does he do that? You have to understand the way politics works. When people look to politicians to be ultimately responsible for the well-being, For politicians to essentially hold the keys to heaven, like they will usher in this new reality, this utopia that we will establish, right, heaven on earth. When people look to political leaders to do that, it gives political leaders and religious leaders unlimited power. This is why in world history, every time a people or a government starts to believe that it is ultimate, i.e. socialism, communism, when that happens, the church is snuffed out. Why is the church snuffed out? Because the church is the only people who can look to the state and say, you're not ultimate. You're not ultimate. You're not God. You're not bringing the kingdom of heaven here. That's something Jesus does. That's why the church is always a threat to totalitarian regimes. When you have the established power brokers in Jerusalem and they are watching a group of uneducated common people, by the way, let let Christianity today today know that that's okay. Uneducated is okay. Um, If you saw the article, you know what I'm talking about. They should just call themselves today. Um, What... (laughs) When, When the magistrates hear this group of people saying, Christ is Lord. Christ is ultimate. He gets all glory and authority. And our loyalty and fidelity is to him and him alone. It threatens. It threatens the establishment. It threatens power and authority. When Peter can say, when he can preach the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, and salvation in his name, and membership in the kingdom of God through Christ and Christ alone, it threatens those who have deceived themselves into thinking they are ultimate. And so we have a conflict. Now, I want to point out some very, very important things. First of all, this conflict, this conflict repeats itself throughout history, It doesn't go away. Understand that the church is not interested in picking the fight. Peter is not picking a fight with the local authorities. It is the local authorities that have thrown this conflict upon Peter and the church. It's not the church's calling in the world to go pick fights with everybody. It is the church's calling to preach Christ as Lord, period. Christ as Lord, period. That distinction matters. 
So understand, Peter, not trying to get in trouble, being faithful to Christ, this conflict comes from the local magistrates. It is thrown upon the local church, if you will. And the question is this, what does, what ought, what should the church do when the local authorities pick the fight? What should the church do when the local authorities put the church back into a corner? What do we do when there is conflict between what God commands and what local governing authorities command? 99% of the time when this question comes up, people, Christians will default to Romans 13 or 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. It essentially says the exact same thing that Paul says in Romans, and you'll see why I'm looking at Peter's instead of, of, of Paul's at this moment. Okay, so what happens? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. Be subject. That word's in there. Submit. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Is that the word of God? Is it inspired of the Holy Spirit? Does it have authority over us? Do we have the ability and the freedom to just punt and go, we don't like that verse? No, we do not. Peter says, be subject. Be subject to local authorities. And just not local. He talks about the emperor. For us, that would be like president. Submit to the local authorities. Now, what, what often happens is people will read this and go, so we have to do everything the local authorities tell us to do. That's not what Peter said. Peter said, be subject to the local authorities when they punish evil and praise good. God has ordained local governing authorities. They have one job. <laughs> punish evil, praise good. That's how order is governed and protected in the world. When the local magistrates come to punish what is actually evil, we are to submit and when they come to praise what is good, we are to submit. Why? Because the way that God punishes evil and praises good is through the governing authorities. Paul says there is no authority except for that which God establishes. So we submit to the local authorities. Now, understand this. The very same Peter who said, be subject is the same Peter in Acts 4 that says this, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Listen to that again. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Okay, so which is it, Peter? Peter? Subject yourself to the authorities or obey God. What are we supposed to do? Here is the principle. The church is to willingly subject itself to the governing authorities. That is the default disposition of Christians in the church. We submit to the governing authorities. However, when those authorities command sin or forbid obedience, when they command sin or forbid uh, obedience, those are very special categories. It doesn't say every time they say something you don't like, every time they pass a bill that annoys the heck out of you, which is like all the time. It doesn't say, all, no, no, no. When they forbid obedience or they command sin, then we defy which means when and only when we are forced to choose between obedience to God and obedience to the magistrates, we obey God. R.C. Sproul said this, if any 
authority under heaven comes to the Christian and tells him he may not pray or preach or worship or do any of, or tithe, or do any of the things that God commands, that Christian not only may disobey, but he must disobey. If I had preached this in 2019, we all would have just been, yeah, okay. But it's not 2019, it's 2021. This is not rhetorical. This is not theoretical. This is not thinking for somebody who's on another country, say China, where they are absolutely obliterated and oppressed for their faith. We're talking about 2021 in North America, in Kitsap County. This text lands a little differently, doesn't it? It was just about three months ago that our governor... Governor Inslee, on a Sunday morning where Christians were gathered together in worship, decided to hold a news conference and forbid singing at church. Who makes this announcement during church? Some would argue there's a little bit of tone deafness going on here. So, no singing. But you're here. We're here. We've been here. We're singing. We've been singing ever since that order. We'll continue singing. What are we to make of all this? You know what's really weird? Sometimes you just hear the, the weirdest things. And I'm not saying the people who say these things are weird. I'm saying sometimes you hear the weirdest things. When we first planted Quorum Deo Church, here's what I heard. Oh, you guys, you guys are the church that is really into preaching the Bible. I just thought, oh, I just sound, I'm, what a great compliment, but <laughs> what a weird, unique characteristic, right? Like, that's what churches do, right? You, you preach the Bible. It's like finding a married couple and go, man, you guys love each other. That's so weird. That's kind of the point. And then, then recently, it's, it's not, and we've been called other things, by the way. I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but you're the church that is really into preaching the Bible. And, and then, then it was this recently. You're that church that's meeting together. <laughs> the gathering isn't a gathering if they're not gathered. <laughs> the latest is this. You're, you're, you're that church that sings. We've gotten to the point where singing together as the people of God is unique, is different. It stands out. You're the church that is singing. Yeah, we are. And we will continue to do that. Now, it's really, really important that we drive this next point home. It is vital to understand the point of all of this because let's be honest, some of us Bible aside, theology aside, if God had not saved us, if he had not regenerated us, if he did not dwell us in our Holy Spirit, we would still want to stick it to the man, right? We would still defy. We, if, if the governor said, don't go to church, and we were pagans, we were like, oh, I'm going to church. <laughs> just because we want to, just be, right? There's no room for that, guys. I feel that in my bones, Like, I want to just, yeah, whatever you tell me not to, that's what I'm going to do. That's not what this is. That's not what we're called to be. We're not just supposed to annoy people. We're not supposed to run into conflict for for the sake of conflict. We're not just supposed to go stick it to the man. So why would we do this? Why would this be important? And just know it is important. 
Luke's going to tell about riots and conflict and imprisonment. This is going to keep happening. What is the point of all of it? What is the point of embracing that conflict? Well, we understand it when we, when we come to terms with the power of conflict. I want you to look at verse 12 again. And there is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is one thing for me or another Christian minister, preacher, teacher, whatever, to say that from the comfort and safety of a pulpit to a group of people who for the most part agree with him, right? So when I say there's salvation and no other name, most of you are thinking amen. Side note, you can say that in the future, right? When you're thinking amen, say that. The church needs to hear you say that. So if I say there's salvation and no other name apart from Christ, you're going to say? Amen. Okay. Most of you are not thinking about throwing something at me. Most of you are not thinking, I can't wait till after the service, I'm going to corner this guy and punch him in the face or hit him with a snowball. Now, there may be other reasons you want to do that, but it would not be because I said there's salvation and no other name. Most of you would agree with that. That declaration, there is salvation and no other name, takes on a whole new dimension and depth and weight when it is proclaimed to the people who just arrested you and threw you in prison. When I say there's salvation and no other name, you can go, amen. But when Peter looks at the people who have the power to throw him in prison. And these are the same people to have, that had the power to ensure that Christ was executed. When he can look at them and say, there is salvation and no other name under heaven. Do you understand how that lands differently? The power that that conflict has when the church obeys God rather than man, and when the church suffers for it, that suffering is an important part. If you want to study the movement of the church and, and people coming to Christ and unreached people being reached, what you will find is a story of suffering and conflict. When the church embraces that kind of suffering and conflict, it says something incredibly powerful, not just to the church and not just to the people who are opposing the church, but it says something powerful to the entire world that is sitting back and watching. It says Jesus is worth suffering for. Jesus is worth being arrested for. Jesus is worth being thrown into prison for. Jesus is worth being beat up for. Jesus is worth losing my reputation for. Because Jesus lost everything for us. Jesus suffered the unspeakable horror of the cross for us. He poured out everything for us. He drank the cup of the Father's wrath down to the dregs. Jesus is infinitely worthy. He is infinitely worthy. There is no other name. And when we, friends, obey God rather than men, and it cost us something. It does things to the world that watches. The church's resistance to tyranny is God's grace and his mercy to tyrants. It is also God's grace and his mercy to those who are subject to them. Because the suffering church 
When a church chooses to obey God and pays for it, it becomes a powerful picture and demonstration of Christ who suffered and died and rose again. You see, Jesus obeyed God rather than man, and he died for it. And it's by his obedience that we have been saved. When we obey God rather than men and we pay for it, it preaches to the world. When we endure conflict, we do it for the glory of God and we do it for the salvation of the world. One of the things you'll see in the book of Acts and everywhere is that the church preaches the gospel. The authorities don't like it. Christians are persecuted and Christianity explodes. It explodes. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. A growing church is a suffering church. So some very practical questions as we close here. Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to suffer for Christ? Are you willing to lose your job for Christ? Are you willing to be thrown into prison for Christ? Now, two years ago, maybe that sounded like, well, that will never happen, but not today. It's not like that. Some of you heard of a pastor in Canada, James Coates. He's the pastor of Grace Life Church. He went to jail for preaching the gospel. You know what he did when he found out the authorities were out to arrest him? Do you know what he did? He went to the authorities and said, here I am. I'll submit to the local authorities. I, I'm not going to pick a fight with you. I'm going to preach the gospel, but if you've got to arrest me, then you can arrest me. That's what submission to the authorities in obedience to God looks like. This got very, very real for me about three months ago, okay? Or about, about two months ago. I'll close with this. Inslee declared no singing in church, right? All these different restrictions and then no singing in church. So it's a Sunday and we're here and there's about as many people who are here, here. And by the way, you're not supposed to be here. You know that. Okay. Um, so I'm here mid-sermon, okay? And I can see through those doors it's the only window I can see through in this whole way. I can see through those doors. So I'm mid-sermon preaching the gospel and up rolls Kitsap County Sheriff car and parks in the one spot I can see. There's a huge parking lot over here. There's a parking lot over there. There's a parking lot over there. He parked right there. And so I'm preaching to you and I see him roll up. Now, by the way, our, our local authorities have been really great, okay? They said, we're not enforcing nonsense. Okay, however, when you're preaching a sermon and a cop car rolls up, okay, and then, this gets better, then I have elders walking around with concerned faces, and they come in this back door, and they're looking around the sanctuary, and then going back, and I'm like, oh, great, it's about to go down, and then I see him out there. He's there the whole time, the one place I can see. He's got his, he's taking information and I see people continually going out to talk to him. I'm like, so here we go. Here's the moment of truth. Am I okay with this? If this is how it goes down and I'm going to get busted, am I okay with this? And, I, and, I, and so I've been able to think through this theoretically, but now it's like it feels like the rubber's about ready to hit the road and the cuffs are going to hit the wrist, so here we go. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. The elders actually have a plan. If one of us gets arrested, the next elder preaches. We have enough elders that by the last elder getting arrested, the first one should be out. So we're back, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the plan. Okay, now here, that literally is the plan. Am I lying, Derek? No, it's, that's the plan. So I'm watching, the, I'm watching the cop, and I'm like, okay, my heart is prepared. I'm ready to do this. So the sermon is over. I'm up here serving communion with Pastor Brandon. And I whisper over to Brandon, and I go, so what's with the cops? He goes, Rustin's truck got stolen. <laughs> I said, well, at least it wasn't anything important. <laughs> and we move on. 
All that to say, are you prepared to suffer? Friends, the church does, or the world does not need a church that is eager to capitulate to every objection and demand the world makes upon it. The world does not, the church does not need to make sure it is respectable in the eyes of the world. The world doesn't need that. The world needs a church that is willing to suffer. A church that is willing to suffer for the glory of God and the salvation of the world. Jesus loved the Father, and he loved the church enough to suffer. May we be saturated with that same love and commitment. Let's pray. Lord, we, we confess we have become so accustomed to comfort and ease and convenience, and so much of that has been called into question in this last year. And so we confess that to you. We, we ask that you would purify our souls and our motives and our thoughts and our desires and prepare us, Lord. Equip us with faithfulness, strength, conviction that we may obey you at all costs. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.